who knows how long back they track, right? So let me go back a few years to 2017. So I can see that I went to East Point Mall to have lunch. I even have pictures that don't even exist in this phone anymore. Whoa! It shows me every single shop I went into. That is insane! <laughs> Apps can track our locations, such as personal preferences, and even recognize our faces. But how much of this personal information are we really giving to tech companies, and what happens if it falls into the wrong hands? Here are some ways you may be tracked when using some of your favorite apps. Like most people, I use Google Maps all the time and I rely on it heavily. But did you know that it tracks everywhere you've ever been? Get ready to have your mind blown. So this feature is called Google Maps Timeline, and to access this, you just click on the little button with your face on it and go to your timeline. So it shows you like where you've been. So say let's go back to earlier this year, pre-pandemic, January 29th. Okay, so I was still living in New York at that point in time. You can see that I've gone from home, walking to school, walking back home, and all I did was take photos of myself and my books. Like, this was just my whole life. And then you can see the route that I walked to school. You can even see where within the school I went. Entered the bookstore, went to campus, went to the cafe, come back. I don't remember turning this on, so to the best of my knowledge, this is on by default. And who knows how long back they track, right? So let me go back a few years to 2017. Okay, so I can see that I went to East Point Mall to have lunch. I even have pictures that don't even exist in this phone anymore. Photos of myself having lunch at Pizza Hut. Ugh. Plaza Singh, whoa! Plaza Singh and not only does it show me that I was in Plaza Singh, it shows me every single shop I went into. So I went to Dobby God Station. <laughs> That is insane! I knew that it tracks like the locations that I went to and what mode I went by. So it will tell you if you drove, you took a train, you walked. But I didn't know that they tracked literally every shop within a shopping mall. So that kind of blows my mind. And also it's a little bit embarrassing because it says I was at Plaza Singapura from 2.19 to 10pm. I spent 8 hours in a mall. So I guess it depends on whether or not you feel comfortable with them tracking your data all the time. I personally don't mind because my memory is not very good. So I actually use it to remember where I was on a certain day, especially when I'm, you know, like writing up a blog post when I travel. I want to know which locations I visited and I forgot like what my route was. So I actually use it to pull up data from that. But if you're not comfortable with it, you can turn it off anytime. So how that works is you just go to your Google account, click your data in maps and you can find your location history where you can see and delete all of your past activity or just turn it off so it no longer tracks your location. So you may be wondering, why does Google even need all this data on me? Well, it's to give you a more personalized experience. From the app, it says how Maps uses location data is if you enable location history with your Google account, Google Maps can help you look up where you previously visited and offer new personalized suggestions. And another aspect of this is serving you more personalized ads. So how ads on Maps work is when you search for nearby businesses on Google Maps, such as coffee shops near me, you may see locally relevant advertisements that feature businesses. You will see ad written near the name of the business in your search results. I guess what this means is Google Maps uses a variety of signals to ensure that you only see ads that are relevant to you in this moment. It doesn't really bother me so much to have personalized ads, so I wouldn't turn it off. But if it bothers you, the option is always there. And something else that's pretty important is that Google says that your timeline is private so only you can see it. So many of you probably don't know this, but Facebook can monitor what you're doing even when you're not on Facebook. It's a feature that's on by default and it's called Off Facebook Activity. So what is Off Facebook Activity? So this is basically a summary of activity that businesses share with Facebook. So interactions like when you visited their website or when you logged in to a website using Facebook, they send the information to Facebook and Facebook uses it to personalize your experience. I don't know how useful this is because I don't really pay that much attention to ads, but when I do, it's because I bought something like I bought a bag and then they immediately serve me the ads for that same bag and I'm like, hello, I already purchased it. I already gave you the money. So if you want to turn off your off Facebook activity, you just have to go to Facebook, go to your profile, go to your settings and privacy, click settings, go all the way down to off Facebook activity, which is under your Facebook information and turn it off. So I have turned off my future off Facebook activities. So in the future, anything I do, hopefully doesn't get sent to Facebook. So I turned off my off Facebook activity a while ago, but I checked with a friend who didn't know about it until now, and she had 1,214 websites and apps that have shared her activity with Facebook. So honestly, turning off my off Facebook activity hasn't really affected my user experience beyond the fact 
that now when I try to log into other apps using the Facebook login, it keeps prompting me to turn on my off Facebook activity, which is mildly annoying but not annoying enough for me to turn it back on. Okay, so now I want to talk about data breaches. A data breach is basically when your confidential information, like your credit card information or your passwords, has been exposed to the public. I found two very useful sites that can help you check if your account has been compromised in a data breach. So the first one that we're going to look at is Google's Password Manager. So according to Google, Google takes all the account details safe on the device and checks them against the same Google internal database. So if the user's details have been leaked or compromised in a data breach, Google will warn the user that it's time to change the password for their account. So I'm going to check my account right now. I will go to Password Checkup. So check the security of passwords you've saved to your Google account, learn if they were compromised, see how strong they are, and if you've used any passwords more than once. So checking your safe password. I have 37 compromised passwords. And they're like, change these passwords now. It says that these accounts are using passwords that were exposed in a third-party data breach. They are at risk. Change them now and never use them again. So things like Visco, Circles, Lala Move, Mac Delivery. Okay, so it doesn't mean that these websites necessarily were the ones that had a data breach. What it means is that I used the same username and password combination in a different website and that website got hacked. So according to Google, compromised password and username combinations are unsafe because they have already been published online. We recommend that you change any compromised passwords as soon as you can. So it says here they have 149 reused passwords and they are prompting me to create unique passwords for every single one. But honestly, who has the brain space to come up with 149 unique passwords and remember every single one of them? I guess that's why people like me are not that secure online. And I also have 13 accounts using a weak password, just passwords that are easy to guess. So another website that I found is haveibeenowned.com. So what it does is analyze hundreds of databases containing information about billions of leaked accounts. I'm going to check if I have been owned right now. What you have to do is enter your email address and just click owned. So... <gasps> I have been owned on 13 breach sites. Oh, this is so interesting. So it tells me where my information was leaked and when. So for example, Bitly, it says, in May 2014, the link management company Bitly announced that they suffered a data breach. So the compromised data was email addresses, passwords, and usernames. So it is possible that I used the same password and username combination for Bitly and then it got breached and later on, that's why some of my other accounts are now considered as at risk. And you can also put in your email address so in the future, if your email address comes up in any future breaches, they just email you to notify you. You have been owned. We can't escape the fact that these security breaches can happen. And as long as we continue to use apps, we run the risk. So what I want to know is, how can we be safer, smarter users? I've got David Alfred, who's the co-head for the Data Protection, Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice at law firm Drew & Napier. He's also the program director of the Data Protection and Cybersecurity Academy. My first question, and I guess everyone's pressing question will be, what steps can I take to be safer online? Before you give up your data, I think it's quite important to understand what is it for. And if, if for any reason you think, you know, it's a bit unusual they're asking certain types of information, then don't provide it. In terms of checking most websites will have a privacy policy and sometimes more information, more details about what they want your personal data for and what they're going to use it for. Am I being a very unsafe internet user if I just click accept every time they say you see those long terms and conditions before entering a website or even, you know, signing up for something and, you know, I just click accept. Am I being really unsafe? Well, the lawyer in me would probably say that you are being unsafe. But of course, that's not true. If, if we really had to read every single word of all these policies which we encounter, I think we'll spend a lot of time reading legal jargon and, you know, not having enough time to do what we want to do. So most of the time, you know, these policies are there for your information. And what I mentioned earlier is when you need to find out more, that's when you really should be looking for it. So it's really when you're interacting with the website and you find, you know, yourself a bit uncomfortable with the amount of personal data or the types of information they've requested, that's when you may want to go and check, or rather you should check, what exactly do they need it for? And you know, why are they asking for it? And if they, you think that you, know, you don't really want to give them that information, then don't do that. Right? So that's far more important than reading through the details of every single privacy policy. So I think nowadays, a lot of usage online is through apps on your mobile phone. So, so how do I decide before downloading an app if an app is safe? So I think it's quite important uh, to know what the app does with your personal data. So look at the information provided by the app developer. Um, I think now for uh, a number of app stores, you can actually find a summary of that information. Uh, On the before, app store itself. That's right, before you download. Right. Um, if not, you might have to go to the web developer's uh, website and see what information they provide. 
So the classic example would be if you had a calculator app, and for some reason it's tracking your location and you know your uh, IP address and so on. And why would a calculator need to do that, right? What about um, password practices? Professional recommendation would always be to have a completely unique and completely random password of you know, a certain length. Um, eight is, is perhaps the minimum, it's quite short, but good to have 10 or 12. And those are passwords nobody can remember, right? So what you can do to achieve something like, uh, you know, a, a random looking password is actually to come up with a phrase and which you can remember, it's an easy to remember kind of phrase. And then think of how I can translate that into a password. For example, take the first letter of each word in the phrase um, and use that as your password. I would probably suggest throw in uh, one or two special characters. Those are the characters on typically on a computer. It's the number row and it's the characters above the numbers. And yeah, you're good to go. You have a good random like password, which you can probably remember. Good. Then I can use this password for everything. Ah, well, you could use, you can use this password. Uh, I would say don't use one password for everything because oh. you never know if one password does get compromised somehow you don't want to have all your accounts exposed at the same time. So That's do have true. a few passwords. Think of a few phrases and mm. you, you know, you're good to go. So how do I remember all of those phrases and all of those passwords and all of those websites? Should I use a password manager? Password managers are good, good to use, especially when you have lots of you know, uh, passwords to remember. It's better than just creating a single password and trying to use it across all your accounts. You should have separate passwords. Perhaps as a last tip, uh, going online is just like going out, crossing the road. Right? You have to use your common sense. You have to look left and right. Uh, keep yourself safe. You wouldn't shout your personal data out from, you know, on the road. And similarly, you wouldn't want to be doing that when you're online. Uh, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. So now that I've gotten some tips from David, I'm going to try and put them into practice. First up, I'm obviously not very good at passwords, so I'm going to use his tips to create a better password. So I found this site called howsecureismypassword.net and what it does is you can enter a password and it will tell you how long it would take for a computer to crack your password. So, for example, if you use the word password as your password, let's see how easily your password will be cracked. Your password will be cracked instantly. How about if you use P-A-S-S -S word with the at sign as an A, it will take a computer 3 minutes to crack your password. So going with David's tip, I'm going to create a better password using the first letter of every word in the phrase and some numbers. So I really can't stand that stupid Alvin and the Chipmunks movie that came out over 10 years ago. It would take a computer about 200 billion years to crack my password. Ha! Huh, I feel I feel like that was fantastic. Okay, so even though I have a fantastic password now, they do have more tips. So top tip here is use a password manager. So that's the same. Huh, actually, I think that this website is sponsored by a password manager app because it says to download this specific app for your password manager and there are these ads all over the site for the same app. So maybe that's where the website is from. Second, it says character variety. There are no symbols in my password and it only contains numbers and letters so adding a symbol can make my password more secure. And you can often use spaces in passwords. So again, that is aligned with the tips that David gave me. And the length is long. So my password is over 16 characters long and it just reminds me, never forget your long secure password by using a password manager. This website is definitely sponsored by the Password Manager app. So something else that David said was to find out more about any app before you download it and to check out what permissions it wants from you. So I was scrolling through the app store and I found something that I thought was a little bit suspicious. So here's a simple calculator app, but when you go into the kind of permissions it wants from you, about this app all the way down, app info, app permissions, it requests access to my camera and my microphone. I have no idea why a calculator app would need permissions to access my camera and microphone. So I looked at the screenshot of the app and okay, fine. There is a function called camera currency converter. So maybe that's why they need my camera, but they say that it's an experimental feature and they still don't explain why they might need access to my microphone. Anyway, if you don't feel comfortable with it, just don't download it. There are a ton of apps out there anyway. So we've come to the end of the episode and filming this episode was actually very reassuring for me because the steps that you can take to become safer online are small and uncomplicated but they can make a big difference. So I hope you found today's episode useful. Once again, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the little bell so you get notified every time a new episode comes out. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!